Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah espinoza Rimas, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of the Arden Counseling Center in Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. And today we'll be talking about It's a Wonderful Life, Um, pretty classic Christmas movie. Um, I think almost everyone's pretty familiar with it. It's an older, it's a black and whiter. Um, it's it's the general gist of it is it's basically Jimmy Stewart playing Jimmy Stewart, but his character's name is George Bailey. He's always Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> he is. He's like Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. always Bruce Willis. Um, and Keanu Reeves. And <laughs> um, so George Bailey, the main character, is a guy who's kind of he has kind of just been going along with his life and he gets to a point in his story where he feels really desperate. And so he attempts, well, he contemplates attempting suicide. And at that point, an angel Clarence, yes, intervenes and kind of shows him what his life would look like without him. And then by having that experience, he realizes that his life is wonderful (laughs) and he learns how to look at it differently um so today we're going to be talking about um the themes of depression and existentialism which i don't think we've talked about to to a great extent on this podcast and underneath we're gonna that main theme we're gonna kind of touch upon suicidality or you know suicidal um intention um trauma a little bit um and then kind of survivor complex or the survivor i mean not survivor savior complex and the savior identity and how that kind of plays into his sort of existential crisis and depression state in the movie so we can jump in the first topic is george bailey depressed i think that if we were to look is is george bailey experiencing recurrent episodes of chronic depression i would say no I think is he definitely dealing with depressive symptoms throughout his life that seem to be building as time goes on to the point where he reaches a crisis state and has for sure a single episode of depression? Absolutely. Well, because I think maybe I could have said this before, but in the movie, he keeps having situations happen where he planned to do something else with with his life and then something occurs that derails it. Um. Correct. He has and chronic disappointment. Chronic, dis- uh, yeah, chronic disappointment, and I think on paper you would say he's depressed just because he tries to kill himself, and I think people pretty much align those two thoughts together. But I think the argument could be made, um, and we would probably have this argument with ourselves when we were doing like the diagnosing and treatment, yeah. like if we were seeing him as a client, is does he actually have? like depression, which includes like chemical imbalance, the kind of genetic component of it, like the brain part of it, or is he just, like you said, chronically disappointed and his circumstances and situations are causing him to have depressive symptoms? Because what we see in depression, we see, I don't know, low mood, just general sadness. Loss of interest. Loss of interest in things. He kind of just walks around kind of like Eeyore-like. Like he can kind of like get it together to be happy around other people or for other people kind of almost like in a putting on a show way yeah but it seems like in moments when he's sort of alone he seems pretty uh, almost apathetic yeah flat Flat. sort of actually yeah yeah i don't think i don't think where you could argue you could you would make a successful argument that he has major depressive disorder what you might be able to make a successful argument would be uh that he is experiencing uh persistent uh depressive disorder which uh, was used to be known as dysmorphia. Which is kind of oh, like okay. an Eeyore state. Not dysmorphia, that's not the right word. No, it's not. Dysthymia. 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 Which is kind of like... Jargon, jargon, Some people jargon. call it like the like the Eeyore disease, like the Eeyore disorder, where you're just kind of like... Nah, da, 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 da. Like you're not like super, super depressed, like where you're like sleeping all the time. So that, it's more of like a mild depression all the time. Right, chronic right. low-grade depression. And because even in... Because even just pulling, general, and just yeah. kind of like a general unsatisfaction with with life and with the way that things are going, just kind of in general. I mean, I think one of the arguments that we were talking about earlier was 
about how is it just situational, right? Yeah. Like, is he just in situations that anyone would be depressed about? Yeah. And how maybe the depression might have more depressive, like, symptoms might have um, onset after his dad died. But then it's the argument of is he depressed or is he experiencing grief? Because people who have lost someone who's very close to them pretty unexpectedly, mm -hmm. we don't usually give them a diagnosis of depression unless it's been an extended period of time because it doesn't yeah. really fit. Right. Like, two, we don't, two, two yeah. weeks of constant symptoms. And what we don't see is any period of time where we've seen George for two straight weeks which is why i'm not comfortable like slapping him the diagnosis like do we see an onset of a episode of acute depression absolutely yeah we um, just kind of follow him from like shitty situation to the next shitty situation in this movie when you really think about of. it because yep. there'll be some happiness to it but then it's always kind of like a sweet a switch like bait and switch where like he has like a really happy experience like getting married and then it gets fucked by, oh, the bank is closing and you need to give all your honeymoon money away. And once again, you cannot leave your town ever. And or like he's about to leave for um, college yes, and then he has to, you know, take dies. that job. And then, you know, like all this stuff that he planned to do because he has all this hopefulness. But then it keeps being like dunked on. <laughs> By well, all I these think, situations yeah, in I life. Yeah, I think obligation and his yeah. role in his family, being the oldest son and having mm -hmm. a family business and feeling really um, responsible for his family mm -hmm. and having to kind of step into that role unexpectedly maybe. Because, um, yeah. I mean, it seemed like they he was pretty set up to go and do his own thing. Yeah. Like his dad was And he seemed so very good, happy. Dad, yeah, and his dad seemed proud of him and seemed like Maybe a little he, disappointed, but proud. But mostly proud, though. I mean, the way that he talks to him, he's very um, positive. He tells him he thinks that, you know, he says to him, you were just born older, which means because oh. he just because he's an older brother and he just mm -hmm. is more wise and has kind of more common sense maybe than mm -hmm. Harry does. So I think it, I yeah, maybe he was disappointed a little, but I think mostly he was pretty proud of him, which means mm -hmm. which for me as a family therapist shows that he has a pretty positive, stable identity mm -hmm. before his father dies. Yeah. Being the oldest son, being like he's followed through, he graduated, he's kind of, he's taking care of his little brother, mm -hmm. um, saved his life already once at, by the time he's like But I mean, 12. I would say aligning with that identity, you're not wrong, but I also think also strongly aligning with that identity is the identity that he wants to get away and have adventures. Yeah. Because even when he's very little, working in that, well, oh, not yeah. little, working in that pharmacy shop, he's like talking about like natural geographic and how like other these like other islands where people do things and how he's going to see them one day himself like that's like the two common themes in this movie are kind of like him being a giver and like an older brother type to every like a savior to everybody mm -hmm. and then also this identity of wanting to go away and do big things and have a bigger life and how those identities are in constant conflict with each other and that would lead to a state of depression and you could argue is it I guess that's the big argument is it can you really give someone depression if it's caused by all these situational factors? Because he yes. does seem like and I think because I his, think, yes, I mean, like everybody's yeah. life is nothing but an intersection of factors. And mm -hmm. so like to to say, can we rule those out and base like just is the, the depression based on a chemical imbalance or is the chemical imbalance due to the situation and do the yeah. inter the interpretation? I, I don't well, think we can inter yeah. we can. We have enough data to pull that on George, but when we talk about depression, let's talk about like the symptoms for a second here, because I think for the people listening, we're you know well educated in what depression even means and is, and like I think people can get lost away like, well, depression is just feeling sad, but there's quite a bit more to it than just and it doesn't sadness. necessarily look like a morose person. Like it can be, are you really tired all the time? Are you really sick all the time? That can actually be depression presenting itself. And right. are you really irritated and easily oh, yeah, are you agitated? Angry? Are you an is angry there, person? Is there kind of this anger? Because really, I think we talked about as clinicians is that depression is anger towards yourself. And so mm -hmm. sometimes I think people have, it's hard, they, it just comes out of them and they, yeah. can't, they don't have patience for anybody else because they're so busy being angry at themselves. They don't have the energy to kind of dissociate that with other people right so when we talk about like all these criteria so we've talked about a little bit we've got there's irritability mm -hmm. anger um which can come out we can see um people gaining or losing weight which we talk about losing more than 10 pounds uh in mm -hmm. a short period of time uh, it has to happen over two weeks we need to see a, a sad mood we need to see loss of interest in things that they like to do 
uh, need to see hopelessness. Uh, mm-hmm. you, that's which when we say hopelessness, people that lose the ability to believe that there's something good that's going to happen in the future. And, and, and also, like, kind of exaggerated, like, with little kids, you'll hear stuff like, everything sucks, nothing's ever going to get any better. Yeah. Like, kind of those verbose statements can mm-hmm. be a sign of hopelessness in people as well. Um, I think, like, changes in appetite, changes in sleep. Um, yep. A lot too of people much, will have, they either sleep a lot or have insomnia or a mix of both where you, maybe you don't sleep all night, but then you sleep all day. And then you sleep all day, yeah. Um, I think feelings, I guess where you could tie into, you could argue with George, um, feelings of self, like low self-worth, which maybe with him isn't like how you think of it conventionally, where it's like, I'm fat or I'm ugly or I hate myself or like no one should love me. But maybe just like, I don't deserve to stand up for myself and advocate for the life I want. You know, maybe why he lets these things keep happening to him in his life and just kind of goes with it is feeling like he can't advocate for something better because everybody else in his life seems to have no problem to a certain extent, like his brother, for example, with saying, well, this is what I'm choosing to do instead, regardless of how it affects him. And he seems like he lacks that about himself. He does. To put his foot down and be like, no, I've d- I need to do this for myself. Or I want to do this for myself. And I'm sorry, but that's that. Whereas it seems like that's happening in other parts of his life with the other people. Yeah, it, that, that happens with him throughout other times. So... What are some of the other symptoms of depression that we would be looking for? I mean, you want thoughts of death or uh, intent oh, yeah. to die. That's uh, that's a symptom. All right. So when we talk about George, we don't see – you have to have five of these in order to meet the criteria mm-hmm. for major depressive disorder. Yeah. Um, and with that being uh, something that happens to him, I don't think that we see – all five of these symptoms present until we start seeing George with gray hair. Yeah, like midlife George is right. definitely like in the fucking thick of it. Like yeah. he seems a lot more downtrodden, a lot more. He's definitely irritable. He has that freak out in the at the you know about well about his life and his kids and shit, like in the middle. He. Well, even the way he... I wonder if he's sleeping. He looks pretty wore out. So maybe he's not sleeping. We don't know. I mean, he's also got three small children, so... Yeah. Well, this, see, but I think this is continuing the... But I think this is continuing the argument. Well, one, I think you're right, Ben. We don't see him continuously enough yeah. in one period of his life to know if how much he's yeah. presenting all these things. And two, we only see him at periods of his life where something really shitty's happened. Which I think is just the way the story is told, right? Yeah. Because they have so it's to also... show you what his all the bad things that have happened to him in order for him to be saved. So, Clarence. yeah. Because it's like, well, what's he like between all these periods? Now, exactly. I think the biggest... And I'll argue against myself and for you, Ben. I think the biggest example of maybe he is just depressed or chronically depressed is the part of the movie where he sees Mary again. Where he goes to her house and he's kind of drunk just and smashes up. the record because he just seems like he couldn't give a fuck. Like in that very like apathetic, depressed way yeah. of like, sure, I'll go see Mary, regardless of if I'm interested in marrying her. He has that fit where he shakes her and he's like, I'm not investing in plastics or whatever, where he like he says, wigs out I'm going to have my life the way I want it to be. That's yeah, like he's he already angry yeah. with her for something she hasn't even done She has nothing done yet. to do with any of those things. Yeah. Um, because of what she represents, I think. And then he, like, his mom is like, maybe you should go see Mary. I think she could be the answer you're looking for, which is a whole, that's a whole basket of things. But, Um, can we talk about that kiss for a second, too? Because that was one of the worst things I think I've ever seen in my life. I don't know. Have you watched a John Wayne movie? Oh, my God. He kisses girls like he's trying to push through their faces. You seen Clark Gable kiss somebody? Old school kissing was aggro. He, like, grabs, physically grabs the woman by the shoulders and, like, pulls her really hard into his body and smashes his face up against hers. I mean, like, it's pretty, like, almost semi, like, violent sort of ish. I think it's just, like, like, the jammer This looked like he was about to have a stroke. Yeah, he was losing his shit. Yeah, I mean, I mean he, not, like, not the most preferred first kiss you want to have with somebody, but I wonder, for sure. I mean, but I wonder, like, too, like, though. Crying with, yeah. and, like, having I mean, a fit and still... What like, is it? I think it says more about Mary that she... That's what I was just She's still say. interested in this asshole. Like, if a dude rolled up... I mean, I guess also it's, like, the time that they were living in where it's just, well, also, like... also, she had been in love with him since he was a boy. Yeah, was she really in love with him or the idea of him, you know? Well, clearly the idea of him. <laughs> I mean, that's why I think she puts up with whatever he does when he comes into her house. But day. I would say i wonder i think also why it makes me think that maybe he was presenting as pretty depressed at that time is also the way his like his mom saying that like maybe she's the answer which kind of intonates that maybe like 
he's been kind of walking around kind of like Eeyore like like yeah. kind of a yeah. sad sack and she's like well maybe well classic mother maybe you just need to get married because that'll solve all your mental health problems if you get married and then maybe you shouldn't have kids and that'll just make it all better right so how do we differentiate we keep, we keep coming back to like he's kind of like the Eeyore kind of thing which would uh, you know, show that he's got persistent depressive disorder, probably rather than cr- than major depression, which is I guess well, that, like argument I would go because the the things that we see, we see him at points in time, and yeah. he all appears to be like kind of the same, if not a little worse each time. Yeah. Um, he's there's always this like little bit of like guilt in him, and inappropriate guilt is one of the symptoms we didn't talk about yet. Um, okay. for depression, like he's got this like this guilt about him that like I have to do this yeah. because of you know, like, it's my responsibility. He takes on the, this responsibility to save everyone and to, like, to be there. Especially... Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, it's okay. You, okay. Um, but, like, with this this guilt thing that he's got, he's got, you know, like, this need to keep his dad's memory alive and to partially keep Potter from uh, getting his claws and making Potterville, which is what happened uh, in the alternate reality here. But the the thing that I think makes it clear is that when we're talking about persistent depressive disorder or dysthymia as it uh, is still called in the uh, medical world um, the in the international world the persistent depressive disorder results in someone having symptoms more often than not for mm-hmm. at least two years yeah it's like long it's like yeah long-term low-grade depression long which I mean term. I guess you could also argue he has because he's still pretty functional like he's working he's helping the town like He's making relationships, even if they're not maybe what he wants. Like he's still he because I, I mean, think what's sneaky about dysthymia. Like well, he's... I think what's sneaky also about dysthymia is that it can go a long period of time without being addressed because you're still because depression though you can still ha- be depressed and have this kind of presentation. It dysthymia doesn't necessarily like knock you on your ass like depression might where you might be like non-functioning for like periods of time yeah. right, or like, like you might blow up relationships or blow up your job every once in a while and with dysthymia why it can also go untreated for long periods of time is because you're still kind of able to hang in there you're just unhappy right which is what we see out of him like when you talk about like recurrent major depressive disorder uh it has three levels mild moderate and severe uh, and severe can come with uh either with psychotic features or not where someone can be so depressed that they're hallucinating or like in some way shape an or angel form or something or like an alternative universe in which they never existed i didn't even <laughs> consider that. okay so Brittany just blew my mind uh, so uh, we'll be back in like five days I have to think about this Jesus. Um, so you know, we'll talk about that later because that just uh, that's gonna go on a, like a psycho level yeah. tangent is what's gonna happen yeah um but Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> damn it, Brittany. <laughs> That's a deep fucking hole. Like, my brain is like, what? What about this? And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going like, to... But then it cured him. So, you know, it's like, Coast is bringing it home. Uh, um, so, if we take the movie at surface value... <laughs> well, if we take, the, if we take the movie by its fantasy element and just buy into the fantasy element of it. Yeah, Which absolutely. is that all was, quote unquote, real. Yeah. Right. Uh, but... You know, the, that's that's gonna be. Like really like, God damn it, Brittany! You just, you just really shit on. <laughs> you also just really shit on believing that that movie is real. This is like Batman is suicidal all over again. Oh. It kind of is actually. Um, so I'm just gonna pretend like that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> when Ben was talking about inappropriate guilt, the thing that first came to my mind was when his brother comes home and he's like, he got married, and he's like, oh, and. My offered dad him. offered him a job and Harry looks at him and he's like, I know that you've been staying here and holding down the fort and you don't have to do that. And I am, I never said that I would take the job. Yeah. And George makes the decision to tell him that it's fine. Like yep. he yeah. thinks like that is something that he did not have to do. Harry genuinely, I mean, in my idea, looked it seemed like, like he was giving him a, a door to walk through. It did. It seemed like he was saying, look, I know that that's why kind of how me and her were together, but that's not why. So, mm-hmm. um, he gave, I mean, I think there's several times in the movie, I guess we can jump right into this because the, well, cause here's the chicken or the egg of it as all of, you know, possibly two argument is, is his quote unquote savior complex making him depressed or is his depression what's making him have a savior complex? And by that, I mean, that's not an official diagnosis of savior complex, right, right, right. but it's sort of, cause I think a common, common theme of this movie, like half of my notes are all examples of when he has had to sacrifice something of himself Mm -hmm. and his dreams, his finances, his everything, his life to a certain point um, 
to help someone else to save someone else like at the end of the movie he's given violet like the last like 100 bucks in his pocket so she can start a new life somewhere else and this girl has done arguably nothing for him besides being appropriate yeah and so he's like constantly putting himself in situations which are making his life arguably worse you know if nothing else just making it harder and basic needs wise like financially stuff like that and feeding into it because all but it's like i don't know a lot of it's chicken or the egg because also part of it is is he just going along with stuff because he's already depressed or is he depressed and because he's going along with stuff you know what i mean like it's hard to know you know what else i just thought of is that even though the end of the movie technically has like this happy realization like he's not going to be a dick anymore or whatever because he realizes everybody loves him blah 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 or you know go to jail yeah or what are the chances that that is going to last yeah, uh, I mean, not, it's a depressing, with, with it's someone, a depressing thought. With so, I'm sorry to be an asshole, but just because if we think about somebody who has, who's already lived most of his life kind of in this setting, in this role, mm-hmm. the way that he is, I don't know that one, I mean, even though it was a pretty magical thing that happened, right? There's an angel and all that shit happened. It's pretty magical and could maybe could really change someone. But I don't know. We learn habits and we do things and we have to be really consistent. The people that we I work with, we mm-hmm. work with, we have to be consistent in the things that we do in order to create real change. So I guess in that way, I'm not sure I guess what could if be, it would last for him. I think the only thing that would make a difference is that I assume with all the money that came in that he's a little more like financially secure and that, I mean, money doesn't no. buy. I don't, I don't think no. so. No, nope. my guess oh. is. It's not his money. That's... It's not his money. It's for the bank. So that's eight grand. So he's mm-hmm. in the whole eight grand on top of however much he doesn't already have for his little family and their house. Yeah. That is whatever garbage. So like. Yeah. I don't know that he would even be able to shake off the normal financial stress that he has had his whole life. Well, I definitely don't think you go from suicidal point of depression to and just you don't just snap out of it, I guess, is the point you're making. And I think it's a good point because I do think that's magical thinking. I do think sometimes people think that, like, especially after someone attempts for the first time and like lives through it, that. Once they didn't die, like that they're going to be so relieved that they didn't die, that they'll change their whole life around and they'll appreciate life like I never did before. Like that doesn't always happen. I think I brought this up in the Hulk episode because yeah. I'm such a positive person. Um, <laughs> well, because we're like, because be like in the movie, like little Miss Sunshine, the Steve Carell character tries to kill himself, lives through it. And then he's like really sad that he lived through it because that's not what he wanted. Right. And so I think, but I think that's the magic of this movie is like, you appreciate like because this thing is it could work as a concept like you finally see all the things about you people are showing themselves to you but it would still be a lot of continuing work because if he does have depression then that's gonna you know rear its ugly head around every once in a while and he's gonna have to combat that with coping skills with positive thoughts da 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 or he's gonna have to to do things differently with his life and he's gonna also have to like you said behavior changes stop being a savior in this town because and being able to recognize his needs and the things mm-hmm. that he wants and have good self-care and have good boundaries. Like, mm-hmm. these are all things that it takes time to learn and time to practice. Mm-hmm. And I think I think in that way, while, you know, it's a whatever, it's a Christmas movie and it makes people feel good at the end. I think that in real life, I think it's unfair to give that kind of fix it. Or once you have a realization, it'll, real you'll life. be fine. Yeah. Because I have people in in my office all the time who are like, yes, that is true about me. And I do accept that about myself. And then the next week we're back and it's hard because mm-hmm. there's so much negative and it's such a, it's so much easier to believe the negative things than it is the positive things. Well, and, they get stronger or constantly reinforced. Yeah. By the, the environment or by the situation or by, you know, the things that have happened in their life. And I think with, with George, what we see is that. Uh, like realistically if we were to look at George here like what we would see is that these people that he's created this town and like until some potter or men like him or people like him in general don't exist uh he's going to be needed in that town because like they made it pretty clear to draw the conclusion that Potter's a slumlord and mm-hmm. like, he makes his money off keeping people uh down, down and living off rent and mm-hmm. uh, if he if he's still a threat in this town, that means that George's company is still going to be needed and the town is still going to be relying on him. So he's going to have to be able to change his thought mm-hmm. process and value system completely. So 
I, I think the the challenge to George overcoming this persistent depressive disorder would be a very difficult and uh, gradual journey. Well, also, I wonder, this is me, really. I feel like we're just like going to rip this movie apart. Apologies, everyone who loves this movie. Um, I also wonder, too, if after he's lived this like alternative space where he basically his existence ruined like his lack of existence ruined this town like he would just reinforce his hero savior mentality and make him feel like oh i already saw the 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 way it could have been without me like it's up to me to keep this town away from potter and it's been it's been proven to me by this angel that i am the one who makes everyone's lives better i'm the one who has to keep this town afloat i'm the one keeping everyone safe keeping them in houses and it would maybe he maybe would pump him up for a while because it would make him feel really good but i also would be worried that it's reinforcing all these quote unquote bad habits, bad boundaries he has where he doesn't stand up for himself. He doesn't advocate for himself and he doesn't um, ask for help. Well, I can, you know what? I'm going to agree with you partially here, but I'm also going to, like I have a half and half here because I think you're right in many respects, but I also, there are people who have, uh, you know, like uh, therapists who have, (laughs) Uh, you know, dedicated their lives to helping others, and that doesn't necessarily always come with the most financial rewards, and can sometimes mm-hmm. create quite a bit of life struggle. But if you if he's reached a point where he finds acceptance and meaning and purpose in that, then he is likely to if he changes his perspective, like rather than continuing to want to have this different life. This mm-hmm. is where like the, the treatment could be effective with him is like so to not rip the movie apart because you know it's a wonderful movie and it does have a good message is that what the real point of it is is that when he changes his perspective yeah well, then yeah. he learns to yeah with the, with the change perspective he learns to shift his focus to change his value system from I'm just doing this to do good right now so that I can have what I want to this is my meaning and my purpose this is what yeah. I'm here for this is what makes me whole and if he is able to accept that which he seems to he is likely to find a new perspective and see a new outlook on life that would produce happiness it's with George the conflict is that he always wants to be something else and do something else he wants to have this big impact when he knocks over like those models in his house that like uh, the model of the building and the bridge. I, I don't think his kids built that. I think that what they're showing us there is that that's stuff that he's learned on his own when he's gone to the library and learned he's still pursuing that dream of I want to be an architect or a civil engineer and build the world. And I'm still learning how to do it so that when I finally get my chance, I'm ready. And I think with yeah. him taking the opportunity to shift his focus onto my purpose in life now is to to be this part of this town and to make other people's lives happy and to have my children and have my family and have connections to these people rather than just using as a placeholder, I think then he would find that his life was much happier. I also agree and disagree with you. I don't want to say, (laughs) but I'll keep it succinct Um, because I know Hannah has some things she wants to say too. I would say when you bring up being a therapist, I hear what you're saying, but you shouldn't be a therapist if you need to fill something up within yourself that is saving other people and helping other no. people. And that's the only thing. Because no, that's, what he's, that's not what I mean. What he is demonstrating badly, which I would also agree that some of my therapist social worker colleagues also do badly, you know, to their own detriment, is you make it that you're the only one who can solve problems. You're the only one that can be a helper. You overextend yourself. You burn yourself out. Mm-hmm. You don't take self-care when you need it. You don't You don't choose you enough. And mm-hmm. even if not so you need to, but you want to. And I think he's a good example of burnout or a caregiver burnout, survive, like savior yeah. burnout that Definitely. I do see a lot of people in our field go through. And I get a little, to be honest, I'm at a point in my space right now where I'm a little over it because I feel like that's, if you're not taking care of yourself and preventing burnout and you can't see that from outside of yourself, then maybe you should think about if you should even be a therapist because then you're like, is this like a, are you filling up your ego by doing this work and that's not okay? No, it's not. And so that would be something he'd have to self-examine and that I would probably challenge as a therapist is, are you doing, why are you doing all this stuff? Are you? And I would say to a therapist I work with too, like, are you doing all this stuff because it makes you feel good. It's because you think you have to do it. Are you feeling good even when you do it? Like when you're in downtime, are you really relaxed? Or are you panicking because you're not doing something? Or do you even have downtime? And why the fuck don't you? Like, and but I do get the part you're saying about, which we can get into more in a second, like existential which part of it. Which is existentialism. is what's my life purpose? Who am I? Why am I here? It's all that philosophical stuff. 
Which I do think you're correct in that he needs to figure out what he is and he needs to kind of shit it off the pot with his life, which is do you want to be find happiness within your family and your current identity that you've kind of you've chosen along the way? Or do you want to or do you feel like you won't be happy unless you do this other thing? And so then are you going to go do that thing? You can't have like both feet like you can have your feet in both doors or whatever. Right. You can't be both things. Yeah. Hannah. (laughs) So I was thinking about when you were talking about the version that Clarence shows him of reinforcing all of his savior complex kind of shit. I like imagined him like in a superhero outfit after that happens, like just being like manic bonkers, <laughs> like just kind of like going even farther and yeah. having smaller things impact the way that he felt about himself and being like, well, if the street, if the sidewalk is broken, that's I have to take care of that because I'm the only one that can help this town and I'm the I'm only one who can do this. Back the I am what is holding thing. back Potter because nobody else can. So I don't know. I mean, I think that I agree that if he really, if it really sunk in that his, that that was his purpose and that he was really helping the lives of people, but he didn't have to. That, like, if he had meaning or if he found that and was able to really change his point of view, like what you said, Ben, then I think, yeah, he could make that change. But I don't know. Having a whole life of giving yourself to people and not wanting anything and not knowing how to point out your own needs and how to take care of yourself and then to show that to show you a world where, yep, everything falls to shit as soon as you're out of the picture. Like, literally, everybody's life is worse without everybody's him in it. Everybody's life is worse Like, I know it's an allegory, exactly. but still. So then, and then you come back, and you're like, yeah, okay, so I'm the one who's... I'm the one who's I'm making the one everybody's who life better. I'm the one who saved everyone. <laughs> like, I'm gonna wear a fucking superhero outfit from now on, because I saved everyone in this town, and I need to keep Like, my brother dies. That. Mary is a sad... Virginal oh, librarian. Yeah. Martini doesn't have his bar. Nick's a dick yeah. for some reason. Like the pharmacist Ernie is a and, drug addict, Ernie whatever. And Bert Murderer. Are, are Just manslaughter, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's anyway. like I get the I get the point of why they did it in the movie because it's an allegory. <laughs> exactly. It's fantastical. It's trying to make a very black and white message, which is that you are worthy in your life and you do give everyone meaning and look how big your life really is well and your life matters and your life matters but i guess the worry would be that like we were saying is that he would in this yeah that that would amplify maybe his anxiety or his guilt or his feelings of responsibility for if he's already like doing it in an unhealthy way that this would just amp it up yeah no because i mean it could it could definitely go the other direction which is he realizes his life does have meaning and all these little things he's done that he feels like maybe are being overlooked are meaningful and that could be because what i really hope he learns from that end sequence is that oh if i ask for help within the community yes. the community can rise up and fucking help me because i think you brought up a good point hannah when we were watching the movie is it whenever i would rag on george, uh, george yeah. for like or <laughs> rag on the town oh i used because when i'd be like why isn't that person doing that or why isn't they helping him you kept saying he's not asking them for help he doesn't he's not know. asking them for help, and he's not taking the opportunities they offer nope, he's to not. help him. He's not seeking his and support. He's just, he's the leader, so he doesn't reach out and, like, ask for any sort of support or help. He's just trying to be this, like, stoic leader. I'm the one who keeps everything together. I think, like, we're working, if we were working with him, like, what we would want to see is finding, like, the balance between the acceptance of this is what you've chosen to do, so you need... Like, if you want to be healthy with it, you either need to choose not to do it or to, like, let this be what you are and appreciate it for, like, the value that you've had and the, the peace you've brought this Absolutely. whole town of people. And that's, and you've been a great father and a good husband to your family, and they love you. And you could even be a better one if you would unclench because and, the like, last, ask for help. Yeah, because right. the last thing he... I mean, it's not the last thing he does, but one of the last things he finally says after he... After, like, he goes to find Mary and it just falls apart and he just doesn't know what to do, he finally asks Clarence for help. Right. He finally says, Clarence, will you help me? I need your help. And it's like, okay, now you understand that, like, there's, it's okay to need help. It's okay to need your community. You're one of the people, I think one of the other things of the movie, and maybe I should wait till final thoughts, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'll just wait. I feel like I'm going to go, I feel like I'm going to go, like, a whole other thing about kind of about the way that it mm-hmm. shows society and the things that it's showing, what are, what is important, like capitalism. Kind of like away yeah, from yeah, psychology. Yeah, away from what we're talking about, so I'll just wait. Right, so it was, it's all, that's all especially relevant right now. Yeah, um, it is. Because we're on the verge of that happening again, I think. But anyway, um, 
as far as like the psychology of this movie, like the other things that we, we've talked about the depression quite a bit and like how it's probably persistent depressive disorder, how he's hey, mm-hmm. he's operating at this low grade depressant level, like he's not and, I mean, debilitated because yeah. major depressive disorder is debilitating, particularly when it hits yeah. the moderate to severe level, particularly when it hits severe level. Like you see people not doing their responsibilities. They don't get out of bed. They don't shower. They don't care. They, they don't eat. Sometimes. They don't eat or they eat too much. They just sit and just eat. And uh, there's no concern for consequences of things that just, they, it doesn't matter. They just are they just, stuck. They don't have the energy to care. No. Right. And they not no for, motivation. And it's not that no. they don't care. It's just they don't have the energy to care. Or, and don't believe it will get better. Because right. I think, and also, because I, his, because I do feel like now that we're talking about it more, he does fit more of like the dysthymia, like the persistent mm-hmm. depressive, yeah. because also he's the classic kind of shut down as well. And I think they do, they actually demonstrate that pretty accurately. Like he just shuts down, shuts down, shuts down until these moments when he fucking snaps. Yeah. And I think that's a good illustration to a lot of people. I think also, I don't know. I feel like he's such also a man of his time. This is the 40s and you know, like below then, like the 30s and 40s. He's a man at this time. Like there's no real talking about feelings. No one's asking him about feelings. And that makes sense for the time period. But it is that class of thing of like he's presenting okay. He's presenting okay. He's not talking about feelings. He's shutting down. Probably just trying to act like they don't exist. And what we know is that feelings don't just go away. They just store up. And then till these points when you fucking snap about weird fucking shit. Like, really, I think even a better example is the fit he has at Mary's. Yeah. When he's a little drunk and she's back for the holidays or whatever. And he, she smashes the record. Like, that was incomprehensible. Like, yeah. he, the way he shakes her and starts, yeah, like yelling about plastics and getting married and kids and stuff. It's like, who, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. it's a classic, like, because that's all the feelings he's been having yeah. for God knows how long. Well, probably Just since, snapping on to Mary. Well, she, well, because his dad died. Well, because that's after his brother, his, that's after his dad died and after his brother comes back and, like, pulls the plug on the whole plan he'd been, like, you, mm-hmm. what we're not, like, what you're not addressing and, like, the audience only gets a brief second to address is, like, his brother's been gone at school. He used the money he saved up or inherited to send his brother to school so his brother could live his dream. And then he gets There's home. Gotta, how can George not be just like brimming with resentment? Um, he that is. He's not addressing. He's not verbalizing. Because even with Harry, like, he could even be like, listen, right. you do what you're going to do, but I want you to know, like, this is how it makes me feel. Right. I mean, but, but, I mean it'd be is... kind of pass aggressive to then go ahead and like still like <laughs> take the job or whatever. Ooh, yeah. But like, he also isn't expressing. Because I, I mean, I understand it too with George. Like, everyone's kind of like doing him dirty a little bit like and a lot of things happen that do seem like they're out of his control like his dad dying and then he can't you know then he feels like he has to take up the mantle and then they and then they, they ask elect him, him to and then be they elect him to secretary take up and the he's mantle. fucking leaving he's like almost out the door dude and they're like oh, you have to and he's like i fucking told you no and they're like i heard you but also i did not hear you and we need you to do it or we're not gonna we're gonna fail so a lot of people do put a lot of responsibility there's on a, him there's, there's a lot of itself. there's a lot of black and white yeah literally in the decisions <laughs> and the way that like things happen they're like if you don't if you're not if you don't take this position where everybody's gonna sell they're gonna sell the potter and it's gonna be over mm-hmm. so it's like it's not even that it's like hey we really want you to be a part of this what do you think it's mm-hmm. like if you don't do this this is what's gonna happen there's yeah. always this really negative consequence of your father's business is gonna is gonna close and you're and what's gonna happen to your family and how are you gonna manage that And there's always these parts that are so that are such a big you know that's such a it would be such a big change and such a much bigger stressor he right. would end up with. So with the other things that we would have to talk about with, with George, like it ties into kind of where this is going, yeah, is yeah. that Hannah brought up before we started talking about the number of traumas that George encounters throughout his life. And I feel like we end up talking about trauma a lot in movie characters, but I also feel like people don't address the reality of trauma in the human experience enough. Mm-hmm. And the, the role that it plays. It's like if you look at George... Like, we see trauma after trauma after trauma, and these are not small T traumas. These are big T's. There's a few small T's, um, and we haven't talked about that in a while, so for those of you who haven't heard those terms before, when we think about what's a big T trauma, we're talking about threats to life or limb. It's um, like a significant one-off experience, like... As but well. it's usually yeah, yeah. Well, it's also usually really though where you are afraid for your life and or mm. for someone that you love's life like it is something like the thing with his brother that is definitely a big t 
trauma. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's it's big T trauma and in, in, in two respects for him, like three probably even. But uh, when we talk about big T, it's, it's threat to life or limb uh, or some sort of sexual violence um, that would constitute a big T. When we talk about a small T trauma, that can be a, a disturbing event, a breakup, uh, a a move uh, away from your family or friends, uh, loss of a job. Like all these kinds of things would qualify as small T where they're disturbing life disrupting events, but they're not necessarily resulting in fear of loss of life or limb, right. which like adds it to another level of like survival fear at that point. But I would say at this point in history that this movie takes place in over the course of his life, I don't think that necessarily they would consider his traumas traumas because it's a time in the world where World War One just happened. World War Two also happens over the course of this movie. Kids like the mortality infant mortality rate still pretty fucking high. Like yeah. there's a lot of probably there's a lot of probably childhood illnesses, childhood accidents where kids die on the regular. Um, and so the fact that he's had stuff happen to him. He's probably considered pretty lucky. Like he, his brother almost drowned, but he saved him. He only lost his hearing. That's all. He didn't drown himself. Like he saved that kid from that poisoning. He got a little smacked around in the process, but he didn't get knocked out. Yeah. He he didn't didn't get knocked out. That didn't kill him. Like, um, all this little, which we would consider little traumas now, like the losing, like losing his dreams, like not going to college, like he planned his dad dying. I wonder how much of that then would be even considered traumatic because, the traumas people were really experiencing, like the pharmacist owner, was his son dying in war, and like the ravages of war, right, the Great that Depression, would have, that would have like been everyone losing World War their, I, right? losing all, yeah, losing all their money in their lives, like through the Great Depression. Like he he is living in a very tumultuous time in which he's probably considered a very lucky person, <laughs> and so, and I'm not saying he doesn't experience those traumas, but I wonder if maybe part of his dystymic presentation, his depressed presentation, is because. He might be, he is internalizing those traumas, but they're not taken as traumas because his life's still pretty good. You know what I mean? And comparatively to the historical situation. Yeah, I mean, the term uh, post-traumatic stress disorder didn't even exist until after Vietnam. Like they was still mm-hmm. would have referred well, it's to called it, soldier's heart shell shock. shell shock shell shock like they were all they all the PTSD terms before the current one were related to were war. related to war yeah yeah it would have been related to war and shell shock created, came about from World War One. Um, so like those things would have been, uh, you know, not conceptualized, but when we look at it through the modern eye, which is, you know, the time we live in, like he's faced big T trauma. So he almost lost his brother to the sledding incident. Uh, he risked his own life saving him, um, because he jumped in that water. And the second you jump in that freezing water, it feels like knives all over your entire body. And you go into a state of shock immediately because your body is going, get me out right now. Uh, So he's got trauma there. He lost his hearing. So that's another big T trauma because that's a permanent injury. Yep. um, Because he got an infection that caused that. Then uh, we see him, he loses his father who has had a stroke uh, right when he's in the midst of flirting with this girl and about to like seal the deal and get his big kiss and all that. And then whoop. Yep. Dad just had a stroke. Like, that's immediate trauma. Um, and then he, I, you know, jumps in that cold water again to save Clarence, although he was at that point considering taking his own life. Well, I think a bigger trauma before that is losing that $8,000. That was the big trauma, I think, that led to that whole experience. Oh, yeah. The well, losing I mean, of that $8,000 well, was... Well, I think it was just... That's it just that. all, you know, does that... Well, that's threat they, of imprisonment. They just, yeah, they just build on top of each other. And I think, you mm-hmm. know, even another... Uh, which I would argue to be a big T trauma is not being able to go to the war. He couldn't yeah, serve sure. because he was deaf because he saved his brother's life. Yeah. So he couldn't and go. Especially someone who maybe feels like they have to be constantly saving people to prove their worth. Like that would be a real big, well, that was, I mean, that was, kick to the they That was a big thing. I mean, that, that I was, mean, that was a big thing period, but I mean, right. especially for him, I could see it being even worse. It's also a different type of war. Like the, ad, the attitudes towards it then were different than the attitudes that exist towards the conflicts we're in well, now. Yeah, it, was, it was very sparkly and propaganda y and like Captain America ish. Well, it was also like fighting against a evil that was exterminating very people. They were a very ex- clear evil. They were exterminating people and had attacked the United States. Like, mm-hmm. they had attacked our, you know, territory. They attacked us and the Japanese. They mm-hmm. That was the only time in, since 1812 we'd been attacked, like, on yeah. our soil. Uh, yeah. So that's not a experience that Americans are familiar with. But that's, 
that was a whole different time period. Like it was a, it was a trauma. I don't know if I'd go to the big T, but it's for sure a small T, like an identity shock and a masculinity threat that he couldn't go. Uh, you know, because everybody would be like signing up to go. And I also wonder. This is just you know because I obviously can't talk to George Bailey, but I wonder too if the traumas were more of the things themselves, like his dad dying, or is more traumatic is the impact that had on his life. Like now I can't. Now I have to do this job that I don't want to do, and I wonder if that though he loved his father. And obviously, I'm not arguing that's not a trauma, but I wonder right. Right. in if he really was honest with himself, which would be like a real hard epiphany to have in a session. Yeah, is that the biggest trauma for me wasn't the fact that he died and I lost him, but the fact that now I have to do my this life job and it forever. ruined my life yeah. in his perspective. At I the mean, time. Right. given the trauma work that I do with EMDR, which gets pretty extensive, I would say that in my work with people. I work pretty diligently to extinguish that separation mm-hmm. because there isn't one. Like, they died and you had to do this. Like, it's not like there was yeah. separate events, like losing the, the person in it. You know, the, the clients that I've dealt with, the experience of the loss is almost never the sole incident. Like, that may be the yeah. worst image, but the lasting consequences of a loss are... Yeah. But I don't think that's Impossible talked about enough. I think I don't think we'll talk about that enough though because it feels like a shitty shitty thing to admit. That's why I mean like it might be a real hard epiphany to have in yeah. session because that would feel especially for someone who's trying to please everyone like I think George is, that would be such a hard thing to admit. Like to maybe even being resentful of your dad dying, resentful. Like all the resentment I feel like he can't not have towards his family. That is ar- arguably partially his fault cuz he's not letting them be anything different. Um, He's not giving them the would chance. Would be such a hard thing. To be and I think, I mean, you clearly see that resentment when he has this freak out on Mary and the kids. Like, that's him finally airing all of his bad feelings about his life. Yep. You know, that's a classic, I guess, what we could call a midlife crisis, too, at that yeah. moment. Like, it's definitely spurned on by the losing the money and then not knowing what to do. I, I mean, it's th- an anxiety. Think... It's an anxiety attack, for, yeah. without question. I mean, that's that's when you. Why do you think it's an anxiety them? attack? And why do I think it's a snapping? Why do I think it's? I I don't differentiate between the two. Let's. But look. I guess I mean, like, how do you feel like he's presenting specifically that makes you think it's an anxiety attack? Why is it anxiety? Let's look at what's happening to him. Like he's panicking about how he's going to solve a problem. There's an impossible uh, situation presented in front of him. The money's gone. He doesn't have the money that's going to result in him being separated from his family, his family being losing their home, the business getting lost, meaning mm-hmm. all of the town is also going to be lost. So him having this situation he's in with no feasible solution, he didn't lose the money. This d- dumbass mm-hmm. uncle lost the money. Ugh, uh, I guess I guess. But, like, I, it's, guess it's, it's, I mean, there's no yeah. way that's not an anxious feeling where he's he's worrying. You see I his mean, worry and panic going on at that time. I think that's yeah. the depression is setting in and he's now cross where he goes into suicidality is where we talk about like the most dangerous symptom of depression, which is hopelessness. Chronic yeah. hopelessness is by far the strongest predictor of suicide in any situation well, yeah, because if you don't see a future why it's the point of living and that's what he hits but he hits the point where he is so he is worrying he gets irritable he yeah. uh has tension so that yeah. right there those three things that meets anxiety right he's there sweaty which well, I guess, well he's I guess, sweaty which yeah. means his heart's probably pounding him like i think there's some visible things that we see as and well. the only thing yeah. i only it's, reason it's, why i bring anxiety. it up is not because i'm contesting that i don't believe you that it's an anxiety attack yeah. <laughs> i just think that it's a different presentation than we usually see with an anxiety attack like usually we see something akin to like a heart attack or yeah. like a woody allen fuck that guy but a woody allen-esque yeah, like panic like where you feel like huh, 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 like people kind of almost looking very scared and mousy does kind he of. not when he goes no, to potter no, he's terrified listen, can you like l- listen to me speak dude i'm, I'm thinking sorry. of i'm thinking of the part when he goes home and he's flipping the fuck out and screaming at people and throwing things like to me that doesn't seem like a I think I agree with you. The Potter thing seems more like an anxiety attack or a panic attack or how we would conventionally think of it. But I wonder with, and I do feel there's probably physiological things happening within him, like heart racing and stuff that would goes with anxiety. But I do feel like with his, with Mary, I wonder how much it's like a genuine anxiety attack and it might be ripples of it. Like he might still be like floating on the adrenaline of an anxiety attack, which causes you to like over exaggerate like your expression and stuff. But that just seems like he's finally airing his grievances in a way that's highly inappropriate. In a way that I see more of what people will do when they've been holding things in for a long, long time. Like, 
couples I've worked with, families I've worked with, parents I've worked with, where all of a sudden they freak out about something that is that doesn't make sense. Because I think what's also interest what also why it feels more like that in that moment in the movie is he's picking fights with Mary about stuff that doesn't make sense, and he's also not telling her what's going on in a way that, let's say you're in a you're in a relationship and you're not really airing what's upset with you but then you fight over your fucking toothbrushes or something you know what i mean like where you filter your feelings into something that doesn't quite make sense because you're displacing them and i feel like that's how more seems like that in that moment with george i'm not dispelling that there is anxiety in play there maybe he's just dealing with his anxiety attack by being very mean and irritable and aggressive which are symptoms i think that he is i think i agree with ben i think that he is his anxiety is what is fueling all of that yeah, though for like, sure like now i have to worry about all this shit yeah. because i'm married and i have fucking kids and so i can't just be like oh we'll figure out a way to get the eight thousand dollars because now it's because of you people i have you mm-hmm. people in my life and it and i think but i think that i think good, he's going yeah. down the but like the anxiety spir- sure. spiral of seeing what's going to happen to his family and what's going to happen to mary and how he doesn't have any control over any of those things and what is he going to do well i think here's the good i think you hit upon something which has made me have a thought, which I think is the good discerning question. As a therapist that I would have after the fact with him, which is when we think back on that incident, was it because of the anxiety of what was happening that was making you freak out about everything in your life and what you're going to do? Or is this stuff that you've been feeling for a while that's now showing its face? Because that's two different things. I mean, they can be intermingled, but like that's, I think, would be the difference between like an anxiety attack that's fueling all these mean things you're saying and you're freaking out and stuff and saying things you don't mean. Or are these things that you do mean, you've just never appropriately said them or dealt with them up to this point and they've just shoved, shoved. Which I don't, I'd have to ask him. Like, that would be a question because you also want to make sure as the therapist you're dealing with the right thing. And so there's a different way to deal with someone who's having anxiety attacks versus someone who's having like deep seated resentment that they're not dealing with. Well, and those start- two things can happen. The Venn diagram has a middle. Right. But- and when we're looking at him, and this is where we know how to talk about comorbidity. Uh, so when we talk about comor- comorbidity, it's I when... I can't say that word. You can't say that I word? I just can't say it. Should we Try say it, it three times fast? Because I, I, just, I, just I had to say it twice. So. It. Go ahead. No, go ahead. So comorbidity is when you have <laughs> two disorders interacting with each other and happening at the same yeah. time. And depression and anxiety run comorbid oh, to each other hand. all the time. I think what's happened here with George and where I I, I dis... I don't have the same perspective as Brittany here, is that uh, what he's used to managing low-level depression, like uh, also probably uh, people in general that lived through this period just managed, because he went through World War One, World War Two. people that he knew, like, went and died. Like, they didn't talk, I think everybody he knew that they talked about went and had success just to drive the point home that he couldn't go do that. But the <laughs> there's, in the reality of world, there are people that he knew that, died in both those wars well, oh, with, absolutely. With, like for harry is a good example like there's more chance that he would have died in the war than necessarily became a hero with a medal and like all yeah. this like i mean there's i mean right. uh, those wars wiped out towns like yeah. sons like generations of men mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. anyway generations like that's why uh, yeah like, like he like george bailey may have very well been one of the only that age man left in that town yeah you know, after world war ii right i mean and mm-hmm. what what we Especially see here like with this these these symptoms running comorbid to each other is he's used to the depression. He's used to this. He can accept that. But once something that crosses into the realm of outside my control and it's a crisis that's happening right now, he gets, he's not generally operating under anxiety. He has some anxiety, which he can usually manage. He's shown himself to be resilient. We see the first anxiety uh, issue present itself when he's trying to go on his honeymoon. But he shows himself to be resilient and able to adapt under pressure and just solve the problem, being selfless, causing other problems for himself by giving away all his honeymoon money. But he still shows himself to be adaptable. But this situation crosses into fully outside of his control. There is literally nothing he can do Mm -hmm. that he can think of in the moment. He loses his capacity for rational thought. He becomes worried, tense. And when we're talking about like that anger and that coming out, like he hasn't told anybody, he hasn't told his wife shit about what's happening. That's also very right? infuriating a little bit. I, yeah. I mean, it is, but like when you talk about men, particularly men of that era, for sure, they would for sure. absolutely do that. Men that do that now, I do that now. I am guilty of that now sometimes. And there's shit on my mind. I don't tell my wife, which I should. Like, and like a therapist would probably look at me with one of those like, 
and how did that go? Mm -hmm. Moments, Mm -hmm. which is a therapist uh, (laughs) version of slapping you in the face and going, hey, wake up. So what was that like when that happened? How did that go when you did it that way? As opposed to doing it the way we talked about or the way that you thought about. But like when you're talking about like this, this anxiety moment here, like he's uh, like, that's what threw him into crisis was anxious symptoms. Like when you see irritability Mm -hmm. like that. Irritability and agitation are two things that we saw out of him. He got straight mean, but he was panicking about what was going on the whole time. Not panicking in the clinical term, because that's different. But when he's showing like the overwhelming anxiety symptoms, he cannot process that. And he becomes so angry and irritable that he is acting out. And I think that the underlying depression and all that resentment that's built up for years, like you're saying, factors into it. But the trigger emotion here is the anxiety. And I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying that would be... Are you a, not? But I'm saying that would be a good discussion feels to, like you are. <laughs> to have with him, to have with him in therapy to figure out what the root is and to work through that. Because it, like you said, it's, it's a bit of both, probably. I mean, probably... I mean, yeah, they definitely moment, both. Yeah, they there's definitely anxiety in it. impact each other. For and sure. I guess maybe because I'm thinking of it too, like, I feel like I'm just like that and then the situation with Mary freaking out on her before, I think are just holding hand in hand in my brain. And so I'm like, this is something that's been like coming. I guess I have because of all this stuff that the way they set up the movie, I guess I just have a hard time believing that he is happy period with the choices that he's made. I do think he is though. Cause you see happiness within him being with Mary. They do seem like she seems like she understands him to a certain extent and that's really positive And he does seem like he loves his kids, but I think yeah. the movie really does a, a job of like setting up choice after choice, seeming like he did not want to do that. He's not, this isn't the choice he made. He's not happy to be here. He's just going along to get along and, or he's doing it because he feels like he has to be the responsible one and the older brother and not even for accolades, but just because that's his responsibility in life, which is so like must be burdening the fuck out of him. And so I guess where my head was at is by that point in the movie, I was like, this guy, I wonder if he even loves his family. <laughs> I think he does. But I think that they do a job of in the movie of setting it up like, fuck, does he have any ownership or happiness with any of his choices? Or is he just pretending that he does? I mean, I think you can make that. I mean, it makes this movie very depressing. But I think that's a thought I had when I was going into this part of the movie. I was like, Ugh, yeah. Well, I mean, you're not you're not wrong me. at all. That all plays into it. But like, people that are dysthymic uh, with you know, like with no treatment intervention, and even sometimes with treatment intervention, like once you hit that point where you're dealing with dysthymic, like, like they call it persistent depressive disorder for a reason, like because mm-hmm. it's it just hangs out with you. It's like mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's like a cloud that follows you around, and those people rarely snap. Like, they really hit those points. Like, people who hit depressive episodes might snap. And, like, he's got, like, he's gone from persistent depressive disorder to an acute depressive episode. Yeah. And an anxiety attack at the same time. Mm Because he's now, like, gone to the point where he's, like, panicking so much and he's trying to solve this problem. And that's, like, the driving point. Like, before he talks, like, he's not talking to anybody. He's just suffering in it. And then he gets hopeless. And also, and I think that's, I mean, and I think he is a... a potter. He's a good... I mean, I think the morality lesson, maybe like the lesson you can take, not morality, but like lesson you can take from this movie as a viewer is this is what happens when you don't learn the skills to take care of yourself before a bad situation happens. Because part yes. of the reason why it gets this bad Absolutely. is because he has no, like he doesn't know how to ask for help. Nope. He doesn't know how to chill the fuck out. He doesn't know, like he doesn't have any self care he doesn't Habits know, it doesn't seem like. And, he doesn't know how to ask to get his needs met. He yeah. doesn't know how to take care of himself. He doesn't know how to get comfort from people, it doesn't seem like, because he doesn't ask for anything. He's like this. He just shoves, he just shoves, shoves it all down. And so I think he's just a clear example of this is what can happen if you don't learn how to help yourself and you don't learn how to, you know, have coping skills and look out for yourself, you know, before something yeah, happens. Absolutely. And I know because I know it's supposed to be that you just like have a good perspective on your life and look at your life differently. But I think the bigger lesson is you need to learn how to take care of yourself before the big thing happens. Because the way I always talk about it, because the way I talk about it with clients is I always talk about baselines, which is kind of just like the the base level that which you like tend to hang out most often more often than not and so if you are at let's say zero is just like regular chill person so when little things happen that would bump you up to like maybe like bump you up two marks on that you know two three like you'll be a little irritable but you can handle it you can 
calm down. But if you're coasting at a seven all the time because yep. you're not taking care of yourself, then that little thing that would just bump you two things is you're already up to a nine out of ten and that you're going to freak out. And that's why people do have things like freak out over the dishes or like someone didn't take a message on the phone and you're like, mm-hmm. fuck everybody. And then you're like, freak out because... Yeah. You don't have any wiggle room. And I think with George, by the time that happens, which is a big event that would knock you up many, many points, even if you were chill, is he doesn't have any wiggle room to experience this intense situation. He's already up there and he's probably been living up there for a while. And he doesn't not up there. And he doesn't know how to handle that spot. Yeah. So what are the chances is he's going to know how to handle a 10? Yeah, there's just it's just not likely. I think I agree with you that the that kind of a, you know, a secondary lesson is. We really have to learn how to take care of ourselves and our mental health and how to talk about our thoughts and feelings, no matter what you think about that, no matter what ideas you have or how you were socialized, there has to be a way where we all have to learn how to do that in order in order to be able to deal with the big thing when it happens, because we all experience big T traumas. There isn't anybody who doesn't experience big T traumas in their life, especially then yeah all that stuff going on yeah and also to be a banker at that time and oh ec- economic history yeah, is, ho- just, is traumatizing in itself yeah um because no, no. i also wonder because we talked about all the traumas that he experiences a lot of them result from him being a hero like saving yeah. his brother losing his hearing um saving that little kid from being poisoned by the pharmacist which ends with him getting the shit kicked out of him and then hearing all the emotional stories of that pharmacist and stuff and so it makes I want it makes me feel like he was a kid that had a really good heart and was a really yeah. good person. But these kind of and maybe he got a lot of positive accolades and feelings from being a hero in those moments, but then it morphed into something that wasn't serving him. Well, when it was never enough. Like it was never yeah. what he wanted. He wanted to impact like the the world as a whole and get out of this town. Like his yeah. identity and sense of self-worth and the purpose mm-hmm. he creates him for himself is bigger and broader, it, it's in a broader focus mm-hmm. than on the impact he's had on this town. Mm-hmm. And if, like, his focus can be like, I want to build cities as opposed, like, bro, you built a city. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, it was a town, but, like, you you didn't build an airfield, but you built affordable housing for hundreds mm-hmm. of people. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I also, and I think, too, part of it, too, is, like, you were kind of touched upon before, is, like, cultural norms of the time, which is we don't talk about that stuff. And also within his family and stuff like if he was kind of like the hero you know george the hero saved his brother saved that kid like he's such a good boy like if he just that became like we've talked about before like his identity in a positive arguably positive way along the way but because of that maybe people weren't reaching out because you know george is such a good boy he can take care of himself george is always fine well and they wouldn't say right how what was that like for you to have to save your brother that must have been really scary yeah. for you to have yeah. to do that because again and it might also be that even if somebody did ask him that question he's like oh well everybody thinks that i'm a hero and i'm really strong and i can do these things and so i'm just gonna say oh no it's no big deal it was no big deal like i just mm-hmm. I, you know it was my brother and i love him and i saved him and the story I think, it could be i think yeah. it could be both because also not to, being asked and also yeah. not even if he felt that way not being able not feeling comfortable saying it which i think is really common of for that uh time as well well also i mean like to generalize it out too like i think we all have roles that we fall into as kids within our families or within our communities and depending on how our the rest of our life goes that can either remain a positive for us or it can kind of get morphed and perverted and something that's hurting us or just kind of holding us back um and it's really hard. Like I have, I work with a lot of adults where they'll be like, oh, I went home and with my family and I acted just like I, why do I always act like mm-hmm. go backwards when I'm with my family? And I'm like, because there is nothing more powerful than the roles we were as children, especially with our siblings, with our parents. Like it is like our lizard brain just comes up and like engulfs us and we just become a version of ourselves. And that can be really sweet and positive because you might be like a fun sibling version of yourself. But if you're like an older sibling, I think we're all oldest siblings in this room, actually. Yeah, we are. Yep. And we all became therapists. So fucking <laughs> yeah, psychoanalyze fucking surprise, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, you know, being really responsible. But then the uptick of that is that maybe people aren't looking out for you, but then you feel like you can't ask, you know, for things. And then you get stuck in that role. And then everyone thinks you like that role. Like his mom. It feels like everyone also in this movie, his mom included, act like he likes being this part. Even though he... 
has other plans that they all verbalize at one point and they know that they're asking him to do something he doesn't want to do there's also seems to be this weird thing of like this is george's thing you know like it doesn't seem like anyone's really distressed that this is making george unhappy I don't think he tells anybody. I was going to say, tell anybody. I think that even if they, even if his mother said, are you, is this okay, that's though, true. George? I don't, I think he would say, well, he's not going to fucking tell his mom that no, he's not okay true. with this. Nope. He's yeah, not going to say, you know what, really, mom? That would lay a lot of you know what, mom? This fucking sucks yeah. and I fucking hate it and I don't want to do it anymore, but I don't know how to get out of it I just because I love you mom's... so much. Yeah. I, I just hate that his mom's, thing. his mom, which I know is very probably cultural of the time, that his mom's answer to her obviously picking up that he's not happy is that maybe you need to like get married. <laughs> and I told you that I don't think that that's what it was. I think it's her not being able to find, it could mm-hmm. be that. I'm yeah. not saying you're wrong. It yeah. definitely could be that, right? And it would really make a lot of sense based on the time and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But also I wonder if she's like, fuck, this kid looks fucking miserable and I don't know how to help him. And maybe if he was married, then he could be happy about that. Mm-hmm. And I know that he really likes Mary. And I know that Mary's in love with him. It's all over her, that poor girl's face. <laughs> so like, for years. Forever. I mean, she mm-hmm. told him she loved him when she leaned over the counter when they were like, I don't know, not and right. six or I'll, something. I'll, I'll love you or, till the day and, I die. I know I wrote it down. So sweet. So I wonder. I wonder what what part of that is because I think sometimes, um, at least uh, in my experience and hearing other people's experiences, sometimes parents don't know what to do. Right? We yeah. know that, and they're like, "Oh, well, why don't you try this?" And sometimes they just suggest something that maybe seems like something, or and then, maybe it's the thing that a lot of people do, which is they suggest to you what makes them happy, regardless yeah. of if it actually is a thing that you like, like. Mm-hmm. Being married made me really happy. So maybe it'll so make maybe you really need to yeah. get married. Yeah. Which I, and I don't, and like you said, it's not made out of malicious intent, but I think yeah. we, we have a tendency to do that. And I think that's just natural, like egocentrism where you're like, this is what makes me happy. So I'm going to suggest this to you, regardless of if that is like your jam or not, <laughs> or even asking if that's your jam. I'm just going to suggest this thing. But I mean, it I is, don't think, again, I don't think George would be able to say whether it was his no. jam or not. I don't think he knows what his jam is. I don't think in George, I don't think George has ever been in love until he, I think Mary is his first love. Like when he sees her, when she's grown up at that dance or whatever, when somebody's like, do you dance with my little sister or whatever the fuck they say? Mm-hmm. I think that he. I, I really I don't know. He takes a strong really... gander of Violet when she walks on that street in that skimpy outfit. Yeah, but I don't think that he well, is in means. love with her. I think no. he's hot for her, right? Which are yeah. two different things. I think that when he sees Mary, there's a, and I don't know if it's just the way that he acts as a human yeah. or whatever, but like it really seemed like he has never looked at anybody like that before. So mm-hmm. I also think that he'd never felt like that before about mm-hmm. anyone. So as we're talking about all this, like what we're alluding we're really to, we're, well, I mean, we're also diverting, but we're, this is a discussion of the existentialism that falls yeah. into this story, but we haven't kind of really addressed what existentialism is and how it factors into those existential psychotherapies and how we rarely just use an existential treatment modality, but we in being a good therapist better be tying existentialism into any treatment of the client. So when we're talking about that, what does that mean? Well, existentialism is what we're saying, which is like, you don't really know what your purpose is, who you are, what'll make you happy. Like, it's like, what is my jam? <laughs> it's like, okay, but it is like, <laughs> what is the meaning? Cause of, like, I think the way life. we think about it in mainstream society is like the classic midlife crisis where someone just freaks out. And they start doing bonkers things like driving a sports car, fucking a 19 year old, getting a weird haircut. Oof. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, or they quit their job all of a sudden or leave their wife all of a sudden because they're not at that. They're having an identity crisis where they don't know who they are, what their purpose is anymore, why they're here. And so they try to they're looking for stuff. And in the way of looking for stuff, they make weird choices. And that's, I mean, the kind of cartoony, stereotypical version of an existential crisis when I tried to explain it to people. But and maybe you have better, uh, more psycho you know, psychological terms for it. But then, because I feel like you're always know more about me in terms of mythologies, modalities. Oh, Brittany, come on, make your point. (laughs) Um, But I think existentialism is this kind of like, whenever I talk about it, I always like move my hands around my head because it's like this idea of like, who am Which I? Which she's doing right now. You can't see that, you know, listener. I do a lot of visual. Imagine right now, Brittany's like, Um, Hands are going all around her head. Ben mm-hmm. just tried to describe what I'm doing by, by also doing, doing it, it with his <laughs> which is really cool. So fuck you. <laughs> anyway, but it is this kind of idea of like because when we do 
existential work with people time today (laughs) but when we but when we do existential work with people we do a lot of like breaking it down to very simple questions like what do you want who do you want to be what is your identity what things make you what's what about yourself do you know is true how do you know that that's true it's like a lot of like almost like philosophical questions like what do you believe in and like to try to kind of get at yeah i think their core being yeah i think when i am dealing with that i think i tend to kind of ask more specific like kind of specific questions and then Mm -hmm. kind of get big because i think that sometimes right the people that we're um working with sometimes can't see that far out so i can say like what is something that no matter what kind of mood you're in makes you feel really good and makes Mm -hmm. you just like smile every time you think of it or and i'm like okay so that is this. So what about, so sometimes I have to go, because sometimes it's hard for people. Like, I think it would be hard for George. I like, don't. I think he would give you this confused look when you even ask Oh my God. Questions. I like, don't think he would know about? what the fuck. Yeah, exactly. Like, he'd be like, what do you mean? It's this I and this and this. I think he would know exactly. I think he, I think mm-hmm. he would have. What do you think he would say? He, because I I, I, here's why I think like, I talked about it a little bit earlier. Yeah. I think he knows exactly because he says it multiple times throughout the movie. George knows what his purpose in life is, where he runs into crisis is that he doesn't adjust his perspective george's purpose in life is to build is to create Mm. is to experience and explore and to uh become in a way an indispensable impact on the world that's how he conceptualizes himself he wants to be a civil engineer or a architect he describes making building buildings and airfields and uh, yeah, cities does. like he says those kind of that phrase at least three times throughout the movie and you see in his house even when he's got his kids he has that corner where he's got his little like architect's desk mm-hmm. uh he's got his bridge that he built which he like very clearly they talk about how he just goes to the library and like just likes to hang out there like he has spent his mm-hmm. time preparing. It is depressing. <laughs> like, Fuck yeah, it is. You think about what he's doing, how he's spending his spare time, what little minutes of spare time this man has. Yeah. He's spending still chasing that dream. Yeah. Like, he is still, like, l- teaching himself through textbooks. He never got to go to college. He never got to go to school. But he's reading these books and probably knows more than many of these people, like, that do these jobs. He's building that career in his mind for himself to because that's mm-hmm. his purpose but I what he if, misses is yeah. that that's what he's doing he builds this town yeah and i but I, and i think that's a good way to resolve the existential crisis with him but i think also the point and I, you touched upon this ben earlier is i guess it would be interesting to hear from him what his answer would be because his actions in terms of like his day-to-day i get what you're saying he's doing all this stuff that cooks into that existential purpose right but also the other things he does is in direct like um conflict with that like being a father being a husband like in ter- no in terms of like going out and living his adventures which i think he's still not the adventure in, part, which i think sure. he's still hooked into yes and that's what part of his like doing all these little things on the side is about and so i would be curious to see what he says initially i don't know if that'd be like the truth though after we explored it yeah. Like, would he say, well, it's to be, well, I'm a banker, or I'm a father, or I'm a husband, and and that would be his answer, but then you'd be, and then you could challenge it with what you're saying, Ben, which is, but how do you spend your free time? Which is kind of what you're saying too, Hannah. Yeah. And is that, are those two things that match, and how do we make them match? Right, which is where we'd want to go. Like, but yeah, like when we look at, like, existentialism, like, it's, it's about, there's more to it, like, that we haven't talked about just yet, which, there's the what makes you whole. What makes you complete? What makes you feel like you have a purpose in this world? Uh, but there's also the avoidance of the existential fears, of which there are basic ones that we all have. Fear of being alone. Mm-hmm. Fear of dying. Fear of the unknown. It's like the dark abyss Fear of being questions, alone. like staring into the abyss. Like- well, we all have those. <laughs> like It's the basic conflict of being alive versus yeah. not. That's what existentialism yeah. is. It's like, what, what does it mean to exist? And that, that whole like philosophical movement came about in the 50s and 60s like where we had just gotten out of all like of these all those wars guys, like smoking weed and playing their bongos and wearing their berets and black turtlenecks was like who am i man but i think it's That's also <laughs> well, like, i mean <laughs> some I of think, it, yeah. i'm just joking but i think it's also all of those men coming home from what they had experienced and not yeah. being able not knowing how to fit back into like what so i did that i killed people and then i come back here so now i just do this now 
This is just this or is what the, I do. And, and how and do I, yeah. I? And I know that it's important, and I know that it should give me meaning, and that I should. But it's like it's so. I think it makes sense that the whole world had that shift at that time because the way that I've read about World War Two is it's uh, unlike anything that had ever happened. The way that the um. The way that the fighting was, the way that the whole country had to come together, like all the different things that had to be done in order to win. And so to have all of your energy, right, push towards defeating literal, like, evil, and then coming back and just be like, okay, so we won. And it taking that to well, defeat it. Exactly. And, and, and it also, took everything yeah. we had to mm-hmm. win. And now what? And now how do we make meaning? And how do we now mm-hmm. make the life that we saved for ourselves, right? Because we're alive and all those other people aren't. How do we, what do we do with that? And I think, too, kind of, like, that's kind of, like, a microcosm example of, like, the, like, a macro example of, like, the micro that is George, which is, yeah, you are plotted as a hero, you got a little, like, you get a little, a lot of good accolades from doing, you know, altruistic, arguably, you know, like, altruistic-esque things, hero-y behaviors, but now what? And is it even aligned with what you want to be doing? But then also no one's no one is addressing the emotional blowback of the things you did to be here. Everyone's just kind of focusing on the positive aspects yeah. and ignoring the traumatic blowback of it. Which is something that needs to happen. And like we've talked about it kind of with grief. And when you talk about grief alluded to this, like this ties into the, the same because he needs to have time to grieve for the life he didn't have. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a really hard question to ask people, mm-hmm. which, um, yeah, which I think is why the existential purpose question would be hard for him, because I think it'd be a lot of hard truths that maybe he can't, he doesn't feel like he can confront, which is, yeah, like, do I need to grieve for the life I didn't have? Like, I have this conversation with parents sometimes, which is, do you need to grieve for the child you thought you were going to have, and now you have this kid with all these problems? Or do you need to grieve for the marriage you thought you were going to have, and now you have a marriage that's a lot of work, but you were thinking of something that was a lot more romantic, or that was going to do this thing for you, fill you up in a way that maybe wasn't realistic to begin with? Right. And do you need to grieve that hope? Right. And with George, like, we need to see that, like, he needs to have this space to, to grieve uh, the losses that he's had, because he's probably never had that, to grieve the loss of his adventures and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, grieve the the loss of this identity that he created for himself, but also to reframe it. But the thing with, like, grief that I wanted to say, like, that we need to work with, with clients and people need to really understand is that grief is a mixture of many complex emotions, and it's not just sadness and it's not bad that yeah. you get angry about certain parts of that memory or that you are resentful about other parts. Grief is a complex thing and you need to feel all of it and address yeah. all of it. You can't just address the parts that seem societally acceptable. You're allowed to have that full spectrum of emotion that like a, a prism of emotion hits you. Like you see a rainbow of color, like a light going through a prism. Like all those colors of emotions are going through you in grief and you need to process all of them. They all need yeah. space and deserve space. I always tell people who have, are experiencing grief or they have someone in their life who's experiencing grief. I always try to tell them grief is weird as fuck. Like grief is unpredictable and can, it's probably one of the most, unpredictable things we encounter in terms of presentation like some people they have these weird like they shut down and they get very pragmatic some people get like inconsolable some people get really sad some people get angry some people get weirdly laughy like people laugh during funerals like because they are like weird experiences because they're kind of not processing it correctly and i think there's also like you were saying ben but even though it we should know this because it is one of the most unpredictable things we experience people still have a very strict idea of what grief looks like and how you're supposed to be dealing with grief and people get really upset with each other for not presenting the way that for like someone like a sister not presenting the way that they're presenting about their father's death or something like that like an example yep and there can be real there can be real anger there and real complicated feelings about how other people are grieving alongside of you. Yeah. And also how long it should last. There are so many fucking ideas about how long we're allowed to grieve and that you should really be okay in a couple of days. Like you only need a couple of days off of work. It's not that big of a deal. And that's such complete fucking bullshit. Five days of work. Yeah, no. I, it's, it's or just like how long just, are you supposed to grieve a relationship? Half of the time that you were together is what Cosmo well, and the says. Thing, and the thing that really blows my mind kind of when we talk about grief just in general, right, is that we all experience grief. We all have things that we've lost or have changed or are different than what we expected them to be. So all of us already have this experience. And yet when someone, when like the reason to be sad, right, is when someone dies, that is acceptable in society. 
is when then when we have that grief and we just expect people to just well you knew everybody was gonna die at some point so you should be able to get over it in like two weeks is that all you need it's, or if you get over grief too quickly people are like what the fuck is wrong with you exactly Why don't you still tore up that your dad like you that can't your dad win. died you can't or, you know, you know what you mean? can't like, win and, or that you had a miscarriage yeah. or like that you know what i mean like people they like people really no, project just get their again. Yeah, yeah, it'll just people right. really project their their feeling. It's like one of the few things where you're like, if people really project their own stuff onto other people with grief. I think people really separate themselves, and and don't really have for some reason they're not aware of what it's like for them, or they can't even consider. Mm-hmm. They can't even consider it. It's just it seems very odd. I think it's less complicated than that. I think it's people can't sit in the discomfort oh, and be their own discomfort uh, of another person's situation so that's 100% accurate. I, I think yeah, it's i think right. that has a lot to do with it um but i think a good point you made ben then we can move on if you want to but um is that grief is so much more of an abstract idea and i think people really don't understand that in the mainstream of like people think it is like you said hannah someone dies and then you're sad or you break up and then you grieve the relationship but i tell people like you just said you can grieve abstract ideas you can grieve yep. like like experiences and that and if you and that feeling's still there and we don't experience them so we just shove it down and then it comes out in weird ways or other ways like it comes out in anxiety or panic like a lot of times when i see existentialism presented as like grief over something it comes out either in anxiety about yourself like that you don't make good choices that you know that kind of stuff mm-hmm. or it comes out in like depressive situations like with george where you're just sad all the time and not quite understanding why you're sad yeah or why you're so irritated with everybody or so resentful and and you're just kind of walking around like with a bug up your ass and you're like i don't understand what it is and then sometimes when you say when you finally just say are you grieving are you angry or sad about the life you could have had and that's just walking around inside of you like poisoning your insides and once you can kind of just experience it and grieve it and let it have its day it's like you are taking the antidote for it yeah and what i think people need to know for like grieving is that that word that that antidote of it is that the the treatment of it and the res- resolution of it which is what we really want to get to is the resolution of it is experiencing your emotions it, and indeed. allowing yourself to be in it and not hiding from it not pushing it down not putting it away not compartmentalizing it is experiencing it as it is without judging it just letting it be exactly what it is. If you feel angry at one moment, if you feel sad at another, if you feel both at the same time, let it go, let it happen, feel it, let it come in like a wave and go out like a wave and process it as it is without judging it. I, I mean, well, how I kind of tell to a lot of people too, when I say, feel your feelings, it sounds like something Oprah would say on like a Super Soul Sunday or some mm-hmm, shit. Mm-hmm. But when I tell people that, I mean, it is kind of like, how would you comfort a loved one? Comfort yourself like that. Is it you have to put your hand on your chest, maybe where your feelings live in your body or mm-hmm. your tummy? And, like, you just kind of have to, like, tell yourself it's okay. Let yourself have the feelings, but just let it ride out and comfort yourself, you know? And that's kind of what feeling your feelings can look like. It can also be, like, journaling and just, like, letting your feelings have them. Or just letting them exist in the moment instead of going back to old habits of, like, shove, 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 ignore, ignore, ignore. Or get weirdly mad about pens or something. <laughs> you know, like, a, you know, <laughs> pick a fight, I guess is what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've talked a lot about kind of the the concepts we see in George, and we've we hinted at treatment, you know, it's interspersed through how, but let's concretize some of these ideas. So if we see George Bailey in our office, what do we want to do with him? Well, how do we treat this? Because I feel like there's perspectives here from each one of our three disciplines that are going to be real valuable here. Who would like to start? Oh, okay. Well, we're going to start with Hannah. Uh, I guess Brittany that'll... decided. Mm-hmm. Um, That's going to come back later. So um, well, I feel like I always start and take too much time. So I wanted no, no, it's okay. To start. I know. Like, Damn it! I'm just trying no, to be generous. It's fine. Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that look of like I, I feel like sorry for like Hannah's husband sometimes because like that like stare of knives like like just looks like like oh that feels like your soul's getting torn out by like Hannah's pupils right now. Mm. Hmm. Sorry. Cool. Anna. Thanks, uh, Ben. <laughs> Um, so I think that when I was thinking about how I would help George, clearly it would be something where I would involve everyone. 
Um, I think it yeah. would really be something where I would do just kind of like traditional um, family therapy of because I really it's kind of tricky again because we talked about the differences with the time, the time that this is Cultural set in and, and all those things. But I really think that they come into my office and I would really want to just talk about just kind of starting with the first thing that really happened to them, which is the the dad dying unexpectedly kind and of kind of how did that shift and what was that like for everybody? And what do you remember? Even just talking about what, what they remember, because as we know, our, you know, our perceptions are all pretty different. And so like the mom could remember um, seeing it happen. Like, I think, did it happen at work? I can't remember where it happened. So it was pretty I, late. I don't so know I would if they said. It at home. I think it happened at home. It was so we late in the evening. Yeah. So I think it might have been something where like she saw it actually happen. So she is just her mind is just completely blown. And then it's like George finding out where he was in the moment and where was Harry and how does this all and how do we make this and so we're all in this system and we lost our head guy and how do we and how did that shift. And is that shift still working for us? Is the way that we moved after he died something that we can still work with? Or do we need to have another shift? Because now, because the world is different. And George has, and now George has his own family. And Harry has his own wife. And how can we, and does the mom need a way to, to, to move as well and to maybe find something else to put her energy into or for her maybe it's being a grandma maybe it's the shift to being a grandmother and to be able to have that experience of her children's children so i think just starting there i think and letting george listen to how everything has affected everyone because i think that he to help him understand how he kind of came in the place that he came into and how maybe that's not working anymore Mm-hmm. And that that's okay. And I think it would also give the family a chance to either to say supportive things or to say kind things to each other about what it was like during that time and how it felt during that time. And I think helping them all be able to really talk about that, I think would help. I think clearly, I do feel like George would probably have to see one of you first. Like, I feel like I don't know that we could just come into that setting and just too, like, do that. Life. I think because I would imagine after that last scene, it would George would really need individual work first because I think it'd be too unbearable for him to come and sit in a room with his family but I do think that helping him see that he is in a system and he is not alone and he does not have to take all all of it on himself I think would really help him have a better understanding and really be able to keep that perception of um of having a different perception and not that I have to do all of these things and more of these things give me meaning and I can do them and also take care of myself at the same time. What about the interaction between the brothers? Like, how do you think that like your older brother saved your life would play out on the dynamic of the family? Do you think it did? I'm certain it did. I'm certain that for George, again, I think that it probably... The big, brother the big brother hero thing. I think that then he felt responsible for Harry, which would make a lot of sense, right? Because then when Harry comes back with this wife and he's like, well, fuck, I'm responsible for him. What am I going to do? Make him fucking stay here with this new wife? I'm not going to do that to him. So feeling like this added sense of responsibility, I think we could, you know, maybe it would make more sense to start with with that. Well, what what was that like when that happened? Because like, that was a big yeah. shift and might also have been the first real real thing that happened where George really where his perception changed for himself, even though he was pretty pretty young, where his perception changed like, oh, I can be the savior and I can help my brother and I can take care of him and he his life is in my hands and I and I have to be responsible for that and I have to take this on. And letting Harry have a chance to voice, when, which he couldn't have because he was too little, having giving Harry a chance to really voice what that meant to him and how George doesn't have to be responsible for him anymore. I wonder, too. Well, dad died when I they were in high this, school. Yeah. Well, Harry was in high school. Yeah, I, but I also wonder, and this is going back That's to That's what like, I mean. That's kind of you... what I was thinking about starting where the dad died, because I feel like that might have been something maybe more where Harry actually kind of remembered, and that maybe it might end up talking about what happened with him and George. I think also, like, the, the interplay of, like, uh, for George, George becoming aware that death is real, you know, like, yeah. you know, kids at nine don't understand that. No. But then to, like, be confronted with it usually causes some shifts, uh, and then to see... Also, like how he would have had to probably assume a, a fatherly role because he, the brother is, what, a year or two younger than him, at least? 
Like three, I think. Like three, yeah. I feel like three, maybe three years. So he would have been... So George was well, had just graduated high school. Two, so we'll say he's 18. So he's he was 18. Well, because the girl was 18 and he's older, so he must have been 19. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Now you got me fucking confused. The, the girl at the dance, when he went to the dance, like he... She was 17. She said she was 18. She's about to be 18. She's oh, about I to be 18. I missed that. But, so either, like, he's... He's out of high school, and like the brother is fifteen. Then, when the yeah. dad dies, so he's going to have to like assume a parental role. Yeah, but I think he was graduating high school. Um, Harry, in that dance, in that dance, he was graduating high school, and That's then a- they because they go, you know what it was like when you graduated high school because they were having like a romp, you know, all the boys. Right. So I think that was like the last dance hurrah for. Harry, because I think George felt kind of old going to that dance because yeah. he was out of high school. He was school. embarrassed. So he was probably like 20, 21, I assume. Yeah. yeah. But I think, I guess more what I was thinking, which is kind of touched upon Ben, which I think you'd work on with the placeholdering, like who are we in our family system now, Hannah, is when the dad died, did George become the dad? Yeah. And then when Harry comes back with this wife, he's not talking to him like a big brother, little brother. He's talking nope. to him like a father and a yeah. son. And I, any father would prioritize their son's happiness Absolutely. over their own. Well, just but like, the problem is, is that George is not his dad. And right. so that's where the conflict lies. Yeah. And, but I think that'd be a good thing to bring up, like in those interactions with Harry from then on, is he even like thinking of it like their peers? Or is he even thinking of him like, I'm your dad and I have to choose you over me well and also just that whole idea that he's had to take care of so like he has to take care of uncle billy that guy's a fucking mess that like, dude should not even be in that yeah. company we haven't even talked about uncle billy no, we have and my deeper we, we don't need uncle to billy. we don't need to so anyway so i just think i think again just letting them all have a chance to kind of voice how they felt about things and also to really talk about the roles and how they're different and how they've shifted and how they don't all have to stay in those same roles anymore and they can still have a loving safe environment to be in with each other Mm -hmm. yeah okay me next to you i can go real quick okay i think with george i think i would do a lot of stuff i think because he is so because he, like we said, even though he's magically better at the end of this movie because of a miracle of an angel, let's just say that he kind of reverts a little bit because that's the natural progression when you um, have dysthymia. It's yeah. Because his baseline is bummed out. And right. so there's a good chance, even with this really aggressive reframe of his life, that he'll slide into that just out of habit, if nothing else. Absolutely. That he still needs to learn all of his skills. And so I probably would do work with him that I do with any child or adult that is brand new to maybe having feelings and expressing them which is learning how to identify them period and it sounds like i'm maybe being condescending but for real though i think he probably a lot of i'm gonna just say it men can tell me that they're angry and that's about it yeah and I think we've talked about that before. I think you've said that too, Ben, before. Is like, as a man growing up, like, you know you can be angry, but that's about it. And hungry. And hungry. But that's not Sometimes it. Sometimes horny. But what, I, but, what I, <laughs> but what I tell children, what I tell children to say that, is that is a body feeling, not an emotional it's feeling. the three H's. You're allowed to have the three H's. Yeah. What's the limit? Happy, hungry, horny. Mm-hmm. Ugh. God. To be a man. Um, and so, I think with him, we would start out with probably, like, basic, like... How do you know when you're happy? What does happiness feel like in your body? Like, what things make you happy? What does happiness look like? What does happiness sound like? What does happiness smell like? What color is happiness? Like, I I have worksheets that I do with children that I think might be a little too condescending for an adult, but maybe not, where I just kind of say, like, let's go through every feeling and let's break down what that means because what will happen is, is there'll be several feelings that the person might not realize that they have no context for. Right. They'll be like, I don't. No, or they give you some bullshit example of what happiness is. But you're like, even when you, where even them saying it, they say it with like a sad face, and you're like, that's not happiness, dude. And so, it um, and so I think you would do a lot of probably like basic, yeah, like teaching of feelings because I would also imagine that at that time in history, there probably weren't a lot of feelings being verbalized. Period. This is like. You had Freud knocking around, but not much else in terms of psychology. Like, it's still pretty basic bones. And it's it might... certainly not mainstream at all. Yeah. And so, and then you might have to do a lot of, and when you're, when I'm doing a lot of foundational work with like children and adults with feelings, it's also like, let's talk about your body. 
how do you know when you're angry do you feel it in your stomach do you feel it in your chest like where in your body do you feel different feelings because people might not be able to say the feeling but they can say how their body feels in that situation and then what and and then another basic and i think we just do a lot of work about practicing how to talk about your feelings like a basic statement I teach to children and adults is I feel statements, which is I feel blank because blank and I need blank. And it's that exact formula. I have it on my wall in my office. And it literally just is like a mad lib. Like I am a feeling because a situation or an action and I need whatever the problem solving situation is or whatever the self care is. Yeah. And a lot of people can tell me the first and second part, but they have a really hard time with the third, especially in a situation with George, where maybe you don't think about what you need or you just have no context for what it is that would help you feel better. And that's the part that you really mostly have to build up because people can tell you like how they feel sometimes and they can tell you why they feel that way. But the, but the problem solving portion of it or what's the alternative is what gets away from them. And so I probably do a lot of like practicing that, practicing that with me in the office, just so that he gets comfortable even verbalizing his feelings to me because the mm-hmm. therapist, I don't, I'm unbiased. I, there's no emotional baggage with talking to me like I'm a blank slate for him. And so it's a way for you to exercise feeling statements without there being quote unquote consequences, emotional consequences, social consequences, because nothing bad's going to happen if you tell me like what it is like. I'm not, I can't I won't get mad at you. I won't tell you to fuck off like unless you're Ben. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I won't like, you know, it won't impact our relationship if right. you tell me how you feel about something. Um, and so I probably would just do a lot of like basic, basic foundational work just to get him comfortable with what his feelings are, because what I think I see with George in this movie, which we've touched on a thousand times already, is he just shoves and shoves and shoves and shoves and just kind of lives in this state of not even looking at his feelings. And I think once we kind of get that and in and in exploring his feelings, we might get into ex- existential stuff. Like, because I'm sure these feelings he's having are linked to that. And so right. we might have long, yep. we might lose track and like kind of, you know, get off on tangents where we maybe explore and process this existential stuff and why that leads. Because I think in order to know what you need, you also have to know why, what is the converse situation. Yeah. And so I think, so there would be, we probably would like have to get into that too. But I think it would just be really basic like ABCs of having feelings and talking about them, which like I said, even though I do a lot with children just because they're children and, but I also do it a lot with adults and sometimes I teach it to parents as a way of like, you need to model this in the home with your kid because I only see your kid once a week and one hour a week and they more likely than not aren't having a situation when they're seeing me just because statistically, right. You know, they're probably going to have them when they're around you. So you need to be the one in the moment modeling how to talk about your feelings how to express them appropriately so i also will encourage parents in the situation but that's just me working with kids specifically but i think in this situation like with hannah you said like i might be a situation where i bring in like his mom whoever he feels safest with yeah like his mom or mary or harry or whatever and like have him practice feelings and maybe start with stuff that's kind of Easy peasy, like softball. I mean, feelings, uh, expression, and then go from there. I mean, we we wouldn't, we wouldn't tackle to. big. Even topics. hearing you, no, but even hearing you talk about that, the amount of times that I have to correct couples mm-hmm. when I teach them the communication skill that I teach them, and the last one is describe three emotions. Like you have to pick three feelings, and the amount of times that those are not feelings, I have to feelings. say, nope, that doesn't well, count. Do that doesn't people? count. How many times do you ask people how they feel and they go, I feel like you are taking this the wrong way? Or they give you a sentence yep, after and like, it and I'm like, nope. That's a thought. That's not a that's feeling a word. That's, not that's a, a thought that's or not an, anything. That's a thought or an opinion. That's not a feeling. Yeah. So I think, you know, clearly <laughs> that's something that's really important. And sometimes I have to go kind of go backwards and say, no, but what does it feel like in your body? How does it make you feel? So you can think about it. Yeah. You can think about it. It's okay. We have time. That's what we're here for. Mm-hmm. Oh, George. Nobody. Benjamin? So for George, I think I would want to honestly go straight existential with him. Um, I think that the there would be some strong benefit to working on a cognitive side of things with reframing thoughts with him. But I, I think really to get 
movement with George that's clinically relevant, we would have to work on redefining what is your meaning and purpose? How do we make meaning out of the suffering that you've had? So uh, I would want to like explore thoughts from logotherapy, honestly, which is um, a therapy that came from a psychiatrist that was in the Holocaust and learned to make his whole life philosophy, uh, Victor Frankl is the man's name, like learn about how to make meaning from suffering. And I think that learning to help him understand that his life has had purposes, which is what Clarence did, which is the whole point of the entire movie, uh, is helping him understand that your life has been absolutely impossibly irreplaceable in the positive role it's had on this entire town's worth of people. I know you've had dreams of the stars and your focus has been on how do I impact the entire world, but if you look at his, help him understand, uh, there's a, a President Kennedy quote that I think would be really helpful for George to understand that I think Clarence demonstrated really, uh, importantly, which is if you think that you don't matter in the world, try putting your hand into a bowl of water and not making any ripples. If you think that you are irreplaceable, try pulling your hand out and finding the hole you left behind. And I think like, helping George understand something like that would be so important. Like, look at the ripple effect. Like, maybe you didn't go out and build this city, but you built this town. You mm -hmm. made this town happen. You made these people not get, after they lost their factory, you brought another factory to the town by using your connections. You didn't live that life, but you had you had a home, you had a wife who loved you, a wife who was invested in making the best life possible. She, you know, yeah. you had gave you multiple children that all clearly adore you because uh, they are very shocked when he is acting, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, having his, in, his crisis. Yeah. They're not scared of him. They're like, keep coming at him, even though I'm like, he is acting bonkers. But they're still like talking to him like they don't seem scared of him you're right that's a good point yeah no they they definitely don't it's not like they're shocked by his behavior but i think with george we need to work on how he defines his meaning and how he creates acceptance so it would be all about how do we deal with repackaging and reprocessing your sense of what your life has meant and how you find value and purpose in it and i think that that would be the most impactful thing for him like you sure you could do cbt with him and work on reframing negative thoughts and treating the depression but i think the depression that he experiences like we talked about it some of it like the the single episode major depressive episode we see is a point in time situational thing that's you know uh, triggered by anxiety but we also need to recognize that his persistent depressive issues are not likely going to resolve quickly until we address his meaning and purpose in life and how he thinks about his role in the world. And as long as he's still striving to be something that he either needs to switch his entire life around and go after, which is not likely, but possible, uh, people do do that all the time and it is capable, but it requires tremendous sacrifice to do um, and a lot of understanding in your life. But for him to understand that the impact he's already had on the world, he may have created those possibilities for 500 people that he never had for himself. And I imagine like the impact of people growing up in their own home and pursuing their dreams and how you have impacted that and how full that makes your life really. And you think you're 45 max at this point? Like, yeah. You've still got many years to go out and, and do more and to make yourself whatever you want. But let's dial back the expectation that you're going to go out on this grand adventure and shift it more towards a realistic perspective of who you are, what you've done, and how that is already giving you a wonderful full life. Mm -hmm. We're bring it back. Um, and I also think kind of piggyback on what you're saying, Ben, um, is and how can you make – what small changes can you make right now in your life to make it better for you? Like, you know, yeah. like changing like – you said kind of like in, what are the hobbies you have and are those bringing – are you mind – are you like – intentionally participating in them in a way that makes you actually feel the benefits of them, you know, and, uh, and also like putting up better boundaries. I didn't talk about that even though I wanted to like with the self care stuff, you know, so what are ways that you can ask for help? What are ways that you can like continue on being a support for people, but in a way that you can, cause you like the, you know, they have the, the little statement, like you got to put your oxygen mask on yourself first. You have to help yourself to help others. So be like, if you do really get a lot of fulfillment out of 
you know, helping other people, you know, being a hero. That's all well and good. But if you really want to be that for people, you've got to take care of yourself first. And that might seem counterintuitive to you. But if that's what you really, if that gives you purpose, then we got to flip it a little bit and say, okay, well, then how are you taking care of yourself and making sure you prioritize that so you can be the best version of yourself for other people? So if that is maybe limiting Billy's role in the bank and hiring someone a little more substantial to work alongside him. Is it, you know what I mean? Like having better supports around you. Is it for asking for more help in the time or is it like limiting your work hours? Like, you know what I mean? Like what are little, little changes that you can do with your day to day to help you be a better, like to help you be a better version of version of yourself for helping other people the way that it seems like you really want to. Yeah. Yeah, because that's definitely something that he that doesn't seem to be addressed at all in the movie. Yeah, no. And also using that example in the end of the movie, like look at this community and how it helped you once they knew you needed help. So how do we apply all you that? All you had to do was ask. Well, how do you? And that I'm sure that beautiful feeling it created in you. So how do we continue that feeling on in small ways in our day to day? That's by having a community that we actually let support us the way we support it. It doesn't have to be very black and white where either you're the hero or the one, be- the saver or the saved, you know, mm-hmm. and kind of break that up for him as well in terms of what's his purpose, who is he, like what's his identity stuff. Right. Okay. So I think that we've exhausted our, our points on uh, <laughs> Mr. George Bailey here. Now this is a classic movie and he's had, he, he's a very complex character. There's a lot that happens in this movie. Uh, and I think what I would like to invite those of you that are listening to do because what is going to happen now is this is this is the end of our first season uh i hope you all have like really enjoyed listening to us this is going to be the end of our first season with the holidays coming up we're going to take a break for a couple months we're going to record some new material but we'll be releasing again in march um but the point that we uh kind of discussed that i think we would love to hear you all's thoughts on and interact with us maybe via our Gmail, which is popcornpsychology at gmail.com or on Twitter at Popcorn Psych or on our Facebook fan group. Uh, you can find us at Popcorn Psychology on there. It would be that thought of what if Clarence was a hallucination? <laughs> I didn't know what you were going to say. Woo, I feel what, what like if, I really like. I, I wish really... I could have documented the look on both your faces. <laughs> I know. When I, I was like, what is I happening? literally what is just happening? said that as a joke. But then you guys are both like, oh, my um, God. Oh, it's like I just told you that, like, I don't know, that I don't know everything you knew about the universe was false. <laughs> well, I, I, it was probably the same look you had when I talked about the, like, Psycho and what if there was another altar that, like, that, like, had yeah. the same, like, both <laughs> yeah. you two are like, what? Yeah. Yeah. But I think, like, that, uh, that same degree. But I, I would love to hear those of you who are listening, like, your thoughts on that. Like, so when you talk about depression being a... Uh, you know, chronic depression having, or not chronic, but uh, severe depression having a psychotic feature that can happen on a single episode. Uh, and I think people don't know about that that is a thing. No, don't they, they don't. But, it, you know, if we're going into speculative land, let's use our, our other uh, media sources for you guys to interact with us about your thoughts on that. Uh, that's let's start we, a dialogue about if Clarence was a hallucination. I think that would be fun. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to thank, you know, everybody that's been listening thus far for your support. Uh, what... I would love to invite you guys to do that would continue to support us. Please keep listening. Please share us with anybody who likes movies, likes psychology, likes to analyze things further. Please give us likes and ratings. Those things matter more than you all possibly know. Uh, For those of you that have already done so, thank you so much for your support. And uh, thank you all for listening. And I'd love to hear more from you guys and more about what movies you'd like to hear from us. For sure. So yeah, we will be back in March with our official second season, but we'll also will be probably dropping a Valentine's Day episode as well. So look out for that. And like Ben said, you can find us on all our social media platforms. And thank you for joining us.